Okay, I think I'll get going. I think that's that's most people who 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 are flooded in. So good morning and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew Van Dorn. I'm the chief executive of Hacked, uh, and I'm also a, a non-exec director for London Northwest University Healthcare NHS Trust. Um, and we're here today to talk about um, how can housing um, associations and the social housing sector and the NHS work together around sh uh, shared workforce challenges. Um, and this is the, f the first of a series of webinars that we are doing with the Health Anchor Learning Network. I'm really delighted to be partnering with them. Um, and thank you very much, uh, William and his team for, for kind of working with us on this, to look at a number of issues over the coming months about how can the health anchors what can they learn from housing associations to anchor institutions uh, often kind of circulating in slightly different uh, spheres but all working it in communities at place and in neighborhoods and and we're really interested to 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 ensure that there is connection being made between the organizations in our communities who can actually work together hacked we were a uk-wide uh, uh, charity and social enterprise and we partner with social landlords and with organizations in the nhs to drive value for residents and communities through uh, innovation insight and collaboration and we've been working for some time at that kind of interface between housing and health and supporting organizations to come together around a whole range of different issues so today we're talking about workforce we're talking about education training and skills and hopefully by the end of this webinar you'll be inspired about the work that that is already going on but also hopefully hopefully inspired to want to make the connection with local housing associations, which we can certainly help you with. So today we're joined by a, a panel of, of a range of different people from housing who, and also from health, who have been working in this space for some time. We're going to hear in a moment from, from Peter Molyneux, um, who is the, uh, the chair of, of Sussex Partnership NHS Trust and also the Managing Director of Common Cause Consulting. And Peter, earlier this year, uh, published a white paper with Hacked looking at this opportunity. We're then going to hear from Charmaine Semi, who works at Longhurst, um, which is based in the East and West Midlands, um, but also a board member of Communities at Work. We'll then, uh, and then we've also got with us Stephanie Harrison from Agenda, who's based up in the Northwest, Connie Jennings and Alison Matthews from Warsaw Housing Group, and also Ifor Jones from Pioneer Group. Um, and we'll have a conversation about, about the issues, about how the connection can be made and what the opportunity is. Um, so first of all, I'm going to introduce you to uh, our first speaker who's going to kick off uh, and, and, and kind of talk about the work that he did uh, at last year and published earlier this year about what the opportunity is for, for a deeper and more creative collaboration between housing associations and health. So Peter, Peter Molyneux from, as I said, from SPFT, welcome. Peter, what do you think about this agenda? Um, thanks, Drew, and thanks, and thanks uh, for inviting me uh, this morning. Um, in a lot of the meetings I'm in, there's a lot of talk about recovery at the moment, and, and whether or not that feels a bit premature, um, I think we're all grappling with what recovery means for our organisations, and more importantly, what it means for our communities. Um, if we didn't know it before, then we now know that making a real difference to the economic and social development of our communities and making their mental health and well-being and long-term sustainability our core purpose, and we know it now. And I think as we come out of the pandemic and whatever that looks like, then actually really making sure that everything we do is about mental health, about mental health and well-being and about long-term sustainability um, really, really important. Um, so as they continue to cope with the impact of COVID-19 on their residents and local communities, housing associations and local NHS organisations are actually amongst some of the few local employers who remain largely the same size. And I think this is really important. Um, however, having said that, within the NHS, there remain significant vacancy levels. If we look back a year, last February, there were about 200,000 job vacancies in health and care organisations across England. And that's pretty much the same now um, as it was as was then. And if we are going to start to recover, if we are going to start to meet the expectations that people have for health and care systems, then filling those vacancies is absolutely critical. Um, both in terms of meeting the demand for care, but also in terms of community um, well-being. So when we start to think about 
the future, we need to make sure that we in the NHS are working with our local anchors across our local system. And that's got to include the local housing associations working in our local area. Because housing associations play such a crucial role in communities. And this has been really evident over the past 12 months. From March to October 2020, they made over 2 million welfare calls. They provided over half a million residents with advice and guidance and made over 350,000 food interventions. At the same time, 70% of housing association households have someone in them who is unemployed. And I think that's a really significant um, figure when we come to think about the workforce challenge and the population health challenge. And a lot of housing associations working within their local communities have really well established employment support services that are aimed both at people who are unemployed as well as people who are underemployed. And as we're here later, they have training academies aimed at developing skills and supporting people into employment. And they have a range of employment support services um, within local communities. So for housing associations, the workforce needs of the NHS represent a real opportunity to provide routes out of unemployment or underemployment for their residents and local people. And we also know that when NHS organisations are able to recruit from within their local populations, that leads to much better retention levels than when we import people from other areas or indeed um, from across the globe. So there's, there's a real opportunity to work together to meet shared workforce needs, be that for frontline care and support staff, or a whole range of enabling services such as ICT, HR, estates, as well as working together to close the gender and BAME pay gap that we all have within our organisations. Given that stable employment is such an important part of maintaining good mental health and well-being, as well as helping people recover from mental ill health, it's estimated that about one in five people need some form of mental health support in the light of the pandemic. I think it's really important that we then start to think about how we can work together. I, I'm, no one is saying, I'm certainly not saying that the NHS will meet all of its workforce needs by recruiting local people. And not all of the people living in housing association properties who are looking for work will either want to or be able to work within the NHS. But it does seem to me that there's a really important link to be made there that will start to solve some of those really embedded challenges that we have within some of our communities. So it makes sense for housing associations and NHS organisations to work together to support the economic and social recovery and improve population health by bringing as many local people as possible into um, our local workforce. So here's some thoughts on I think how we might do that. I think the first is to build shared workforce development programs across the two types of organisation. We have lots of very similar roles across our organisations and it makes sense to promote integration by joint and shared skills uh, development. I think we need to work with providers of employment and pre-employment support to develop skills and build confidence amongst those furthest from the labour market. I think we need to adopt a more networked approach to employment support and particularly I think a place so that people can, someone can quickly access the right level of support that links to the multidisciplinary teams and social prescribers within the primary care networks. I think that COVID-19 has demonstrated the importance of integration as the only way of addressing some of the complex challenges that we face. And there's a considerable opportunity to build longer term collaborations between housing associations and NHS trusts and to grow the resources available to our communities. I know that a lot of people on this call will know this and will believe this, but I think it, it, it bears repetition, that being an anchor institution isn't a project, it's not an initiative, it's a way of being, it's who we are and it's how we're seen and how we see ourselves and I think that 
NHS trusts and housing associations both believe that and both have that at their core. And I think if we can bring them together and find ways of working together, we can add real social value uh, for the communities um, that we serve. So those are my thoughts, Drew. Thank you so much, Peter. And um, we'll just publish into the chat uh, a, a link to a blog that we're publishing today from Peter, kind of talking a bit more about those opportunities. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll um, kind of unpack some of that as we go along and hear from other people. And we'll come back as part of the, as the discussion. And as we go along, please do use the question and answer function in, in Zoom, put your questions in there, any thoughts you've got, any questions you've got, and we'll pick those up as part of the conversation. So as, as Peter said, there's, there is a huge opportunity here. And it's not an opportunity that exists only in one, off, one or two communities, it actually exists across the whole of England. And, and, and the employment education skills agenda is a, is a key part of the work that housing associations do in, in, through their community investment work and also in neighbourhoods across the country. And I'm delighted that we're joined today by Charmaine Semi. Uh, Charmaine, if you'd like to turn your camera on. Um, Charmaine is the Director of Community Investment at Longhurst um, and Longhurst is a, a large a large housing association that works across much of the Midlands, East Midlands and, and over into the East as well. But also Charmaine is a board member of Communities at Work and Communities at Work is the national network of housing associations who, uh, who work in this space. Um, and Charmaine is going to kind of talk a bit about that national network but also the, 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 the breadth of the work that goes on across uh, the country from housing associations in this space. So over to you, Charmaine. Thank you, Drew. Um, and uh, really excited to be kind of part of this uh, debate today. Um, I, I don't want to repeat uh, much of what Peter said, which was a, a fantastic introduction into this discussion. But I think to reiterate, yes, housing associations have uh, had employment and skills agenda as a cornerstone of their offer um, and it's kind of central to uh, the delivery around their social purpose. Um, we as a sector we often refer to ourselves as community anchors um, and a term that we've really learned to embrace in, in recent times. Um, again as Peter said you know we have long-standing relationships with our customers and, and, and the communities we serve and the stakeholders and we are acutely aware of the transformative power of, of work and conversely the destructive power wrought on families of uh, living under the cloud of long-term intergenerational unemployment and the negative uh, health and well-being outcomes associated with that. As a sector um, we work with customers, uh, a wide range of customers along the kind of ABC pathway uh, into work, any job, a better job and a career. Um, and there is a, a breadth of offer uh, uh, underneath that. And I've got a number of colleagues today who are exemplars in the field who will be able to um, demonstrate the type of uh, innovative delivery um, we can achieve when you have the right people at the right time, all around the right table committed to the same goal. So how do we fund our work? We fund our work in a variety of ways um, and communities that work in 2009 uh, reported that in 2019-20, an estimated 76 million pounds was invested by housing associations providing uh, employment support and services for their residents. Much of our work is either core funded or match funded through grants. And many services you will see in operation today have been partially funded through the European Social Fund. Um, the European Social Fund, unsurprisingly, is due to come to an end, um, given our departure from the European Union. And it is due to be replaced by the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. And the main aim of this fund is to level up, uh, a term we've all become familiar with in recent times, and create opportunities for people across the UK. The government have suggested that the total UK wide fund would at least match the existing European social fund receipts, averaging around 1.5 billion annually. And I do think this is a particular space that maybe we could look to work together on through HAL and um, HACT. The priorities under the UK, UK Shared Prosperity Fund is investment in people, 
and that's specifically around uh, skills tailored to local needs and work-based training, investment in communities and place, cultural, sporting and digital connectivity, and investment in local businesses. Just briefly around communities that work. Communities that work is the only industry body within housing that is dedicated to the employment agenda. Um, communities that work are the only uh, consortia uh, housing providers with an open and ongoing dialogue with government with regards to the relationship between housing providers and um, employment and skills services. Our members manage approximately 1.3 million homes. We work in strategic alliances and formal partnerships with other organisations, including the Housing and Employment Task Force, that, uh, Communities That Work Chair, whose members also include the National Housing Federation and, um, are, and, and HACT. Um, I think what I would like to kind of conclude on before we kind of move over to a short video, um, Communities that work sit on the all, parli all party parliamentary group for housing and social mobility. The all party parliamentary group on housing and social mobility aims to champion social housing providers that support residents to, to secure sustainable livelihoods. Um, it's national inquiry into housing and employment, examining the social housing, uh, employment and earnings gap launched its findings in October 2020. I'd like to end my introduction today uh, with a short video outlining the key findings of this report. I think this is where I say QVT. Employment rates, earnings and advancement in work are generally lower for working age people in social housing than for working age people who privately rent or own their own home. Most of this can be readily explained, but stubborn barriers remain. Through this new piece of research, the APPG for Housing and Social Mobility has examined, firstly, the barriers people of working age in social housing face when seeking meaningful and rewarding employment. Secondly, the success factors from social landlords' initiatives to help people secure work and grow in their jobs. And thirdly, which policies could secure better outcomes for people in social housing and their communities? This video summarises the key findings of the APPG Inquiries Report and spotlights the areas where policymakers should focus their attention to help drive forward employment and training for thousands of people across the UK. Stigma and discrimination are still apparent in some discussions about social housing, and critics of the sector often suggest there is something about social housing that worsens the employment prospects of its residents. The evidence says this is not so. Social housing at affordable rents can give people the security they need to create a foundation for success helping them overcome barriers and, in turn, secure employment. But we need to do more to tackle barriers such as job availability and jobs quality, transport and childcare support networks that all affect people's employment success. This new report examines how these barriers can be lowered and help increase social mobility for working age social housing tenants. European Social Funding, or ESF, is on a cliff edge and will soon run out. Housing providers rely on this funding in order to deliver many of their employment and training services and support people into work. Can the proposed Shared Prosperity Fund fill the gap? If these funds aren't replaced, we'll risk widening the social mobility gap and be rowing back on the levelling up agenda promised in 2019. A national, one-size-fits-all approach fails to deliver impact in the regions, preventing smaller housing providers and partners from teaming up to deliver support in areas that need it. Instead, programmes and investment should focus on aligning to local job markets. Local government, local housing providers and partners can better deliver employment support to meet the needs of local communities. 
A localised approach will lead to better outcomes and a more efficient use of funding. The housing sector has a long record of directing investment back into its community by offering employment, skills and apprenticeship support. We can harness this power to guarantee that jobs and apprenticeship opportunities are created for local people by requiring our suppliers and contractors to commit to providing these opportunities. There's clear evidence from this inquiry that providing support across the entire employment journey works. This means focusing on employability, creating mentoring opportunities, and providing customized one-to-one -one support for those far from work, as well as training, education and skills, and job search support. Alongside all of this, we must remove long-standing wider barriers to employment. These include poor or expensive public transport, which limits the search area for employment, accessible, affordable childcare needs to be prioritised by both housing associations and by government, temporary, time-limited financial support for those entering the job market to help cover extra essential costs related to starting a job, and finally, eradicating digital exclusion with access to quality, affordable broadband for all. Without removing these barriers to work, we risk failing to create the right conditions that support working age people from taking steps towards employment or succeeding in work. Thank you, Charmaine, for, for kind of sharing that video with us as well and just kind of outline some of the opportunity of, of working with housing associations. Um, so we're now, we're now going to hear from three uh, housing associations in different parts of the country about the work that they do uh, and also about how they see this opportunity of working more closely with the NHS around uh, workforce uh, and, and helping people into those more sustainable employment opportunities. And the first organisation we're going to hear from is Regenda, and we're going to hear from uh, Stephanie Harrison, who's Executive Director of Operations and Customers at Regenda. And Regenda is a large organisation across the Northwest, working across many parts of the Northwest. And also, uh, Stephanie has been uh, leading a piece of work uh, with the support of HACT in uh, the Cheshire and Merseyside Health and Care Partnership, looking at developing this relationship further. Uh, and as part of that, uh, Stephanie was also invited to join the People Board at the ICS. And I think po possibly, I can say this without doubt, that Stephanie is probably the only housing person who sits on a People Board anywhere in the NHS. And I think that's really uh, important development because it demonstrates for the people in Cheshire and Merseyside that actually they need to reach out to new partners, such as those in housing, uh, to be able to uh, address the, 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 the strategic uh, challenges that they have in that part of the country. So Stephanie, uh, tell us a bit about your work, but also a bit about you know, the breadth of your work in communities and the work of your training academy, uh, the Foundry, Learning Foundry in Liverpool. Thanks, Drew. And um, I'm absolutely stunned at the amount of colleagues from NHS that have come onto the webinar. I've got over 77. So just thank you, everybody, for taking the time to come and listen to what we've got to say. Um, I've worked in housing 25 years and I just think there's a there's never been a time that we've been more needed and there's never been a time that we've more needed to find really strong partners to work with, um, such as yourselves. So Regenda's got about um, 13,000 properties around the northwest, but the, I think the significant thing about our organisation is that we've diversified over the last um, 10 years. And the reason for that started with our health and well-being strategy after the first Marmot review, where we really started to understand how we could use our um, all of our assets to make an impact on health. Um, and one of the ways we thought that we could really make a difference was around um, people having a job and having a job being a social determinant of your health. So we started with a health and well-being strategy. And 10 years on, we've got quite a unique structure with 10 different businesses within the organisation all working to that endeavour. Um, one of them, as Drew said, is a training company, which we bought in 2017. 
So in the last video, you've just seen that a lot of um, organisations will use European funding to, to do the work programmes for their residents and communities. Um, so we have used that funding and we've used it in collaboration with our partners, but also we've used our own funding um, in terms of our reserves to, to make a difference. And then we thought we needed to put some more money where our mouth was. And we, we bought the training company in 2017 as a way of trying to understand how you could use government mainstream funding as well to help our organisation, our tenants into work. Because if you're using other funding, quite often you're bound by the regulations for it. And also if you're using your own reserves all the time, that only gets you so far and it'll stop you from doing other necessary work in the future. So when we bought the training company, it did operate in health and social care. So we were doing qualifications predominantly in the care sector, but they were also the biggest provider of dental nurses across the Northwest. So for us, it was a perfect opportunity just to see how this relationship with health could work in different ways. And then something that we could grow and build on because for us, the NHS was always one of the prizes in terms of another anchor institution that we could get alongside with a long-term business plan and long-term forecasting. So there was lots of learning that took place. Um, and over the last four years, we've really grown the organisation as well. We've used it for workforce development within the housing sector. So we do housing qualifications, not just for our own organisation, but the other housing associations across the Northwest. We do custom service, team leading, stuff that can literally track over into other sectors such as, um, such as your own, but also out into business as well. Because I think we've got a real understanding of what we all need as employers, not just as those that are working within communities. So it is very employer led the work that we're doing because we know what it feels like in our own business. Um, the SSA funding from the skills funding agency is like the gift that keeps on giving for us. So we're able to run traineeships for our communities where you've got 16 to 18 year olds that haven't been in employment or education. We've got money for training for people who are 19 plus. We can offer apprenticeships with those quite often. You also at the moment get, um, get an incentive to put um, apprentices in your business. And over the years, this is something that as an organization, we'd paid for it ourselves, but also um, for our communities as well, we'd paid out of our, our own reserves. And now we use the SFA funding. And what the organization does is we use our money to fill the gaps, the things that that funding does not cover um, to make sure that we have a full like wraparound for the people that come on the programs. So that, that, that is going from strength to strength in terms of um, how we can use the training company. Um, and it's also been a great way of attracting new talents into our own business and people that necessarily wouldn't have come forward for opportunities if they'd have just been advertised in the traditional way. We've had people who've come through adult education courses that have lost the confidence. They might have had jobs in the past. They might have gone off to have children and feel now that they can't um, come back into the workplace. They've come on programmes to make friends, just meet new people. Um, and by the way, at the end, we've put them for an interview for the job. Um, and we've had some real success stories from people that have come through that route where they just need probably a little bit more coaxing into employment or they need to be worked with on a deeper level. We've been able to do all that through, um, through the training company and through some great partnerships. So we've also been working with, um, with Drew and Peter on an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with Cheshire and Mersey NHS Trust. And they, they've been really forward thinking and partnering with us to say, we know that we've got a common agenda here. We can understand if we get communities into where the impact on both sectors at a very deep level. Um, also very enlightened in terms of what work our residents might need to get them into employment. Um, so the MOU will, is about working at a deeper level as two anchors um, and getting um, some collaboration across all the different levels in the organisation. Because I, I know that, you know, my chief exec might say, right, we're all doing this. By the time it gets down to the junior staff, the message is being lost, it's being diluted. They don't really understand what sometimes what they're meant to be doing. So by getting the MOU, we've been building up relationships with colleagues at different levels in, in the, the two organisations to make sure that everybody is on the right page with it. And a lot of learning and a lot of understanding. 
about what yourselves need, what we need, what the communities need to be able to take up these opportunities. Um, so there's a steering group now over in the Sissy region. The housing associations um, have funded this together. So there's 15 housing associations working on this. We've designed um, a programme. We've got a brand around it. And we're working with Cheshire on Mersey on getting some pilot projects up and running. Um, and as Drew said, I'm sitting on the people's board and it's just, it's just really enlightening to see how the NHS talks about recruitment, how you go about recruitment, what the jobs look like, trying to think of them from a layperson's point of view sometimes when the language is quite technical about the job. But when you look through it, you can see that actually some of our, our residents will have the right skills, the right behaviours, the right values. So different ways, I think, about recruiting, looking at junk campaigns together. Um, obviously, we are in people's houses um, every day. We have a really strong relationship with our residents. We know them at a really deep level. So just looking at how we can utilise this to best serve some of the opportunities that are there at the moment within the health sector and also within our own sector, because we've recognised that some of those values and behaviours, we track across the two different sectors. Um, and we're probably fishing in the same pool and we need to think about why than that and doing things differently. So there's an awful lot happening. Um, it's took us, well, it's took our organisation 10 years really to understand how we can do this properly and not just tinker around the edges and, and maybe throwing good money after bad in terms of setting programmes up, but they don't really hit the mark. Um, and the Education and Skills Funding Agency are phenomenally helpful in making sure that the funding is there for us to be able to reach out properly and they are very supportive of any innovation that we take to them and are literally coming to me um, and giving us funding sometimes without even having to bid for it because they recognise the level of need that's out there and um, just the way that we work and the way that everything is really tailored to the individual and um, there's no you know some stuff in the press at the moment about fat cat um, chief execs in, in our sector. Let me tell you, um, they're, they're busting a gut on this agenda to get people into where if we don't have to do it with a house with a landlord, as long as we've got to put a good roof over people's heads, you would say that our job is done. But we're really committed to making sure that people have the kind of great lives and the opportunities that you know people like us get and making sure that we get the route ways and the pathways in there for them. Um, so I'm going to shut up there, Drew. Um, I've seen a few questions come into the Q&A, so I'll have a little look, look through them. But we are, as you, you can't tell, we're absolutely passionate about this and we need willing colleagues um, who want to come forward and have, have, have a common view on making this work for our communities and for your workforce needs as well as our own. Thanks so much, Steph. Um, so we're going to now hear from Walsall Housing Group, WHG, and um, we're going to hear from Connie Jennings, who's the Head of Health and Wellbeing, and her colleague, Alison Matthews, who is the uh, Employment and Skills Manager. And you heard earlier Charmaine say that the housing associations spend, you know, roughly 70 odd million pounds a year on uh, kind of employment programmes. That's about 10% of the overall 750 million pounds that housing associations spend each year in kind of community-based and com programs, and we call that community investment. Um, and the other area of significant spend within housing associations is the work that we do on health and well-being, and lots of work in the community. And a lot of the work that Connie does is kind of is in that space. So, so there's a lot of work that we do in housing to connect the agendas around education, training, and employment, and also health and well-being. And you know, lots of work in pre-employment, lots of work in helping people to build confidence, to get them out, and to to start to engage and start to see the opportunity of working. Uh, and, and, and going and, find, and finding good jobs. Um, so I'm really delighted that we've got Connie and Alison with us, the kind of a, a double act that combine and blend that kind of health and wellbeing approach with that employment and skills approach. So over to you, Connie. Good morning, everybody. Happy Fun Friday. Um, Drew got my job title wrong because my job title is actually the best job in the world because um, I get the chance to um, see people's lives change for the better in lots of different ways. Um, housing associations have got an invested interest in health because at least a third of our customers will be impacted by the wider determinants of health. So our relationship with health has evolved and grown, I would say, over the last sort of three to five years. And it's taken us quite a long time to get around the table. But WHG has now joined the local 
um, ICP, sit on the board, I sit on SMT. So we're actually working with colleagues in the NHS and adult social care to make decisions about population health that will directly impact on our residents. And why that's important is that some of the work that we do can stop the NHS having customers for their services. So it's a bit of a double whammy really. If the work that we do improves people's health and wellbeing, and a really key aspect of that is giving somebody a job, um, then we reduce the impact and the pressure on services within the health sphere. So we see it as almost a double um, opportunity really for both of us. So um, we do lots of different things with our, our health partners, but the one thing we want to talk about today is our workforce development um, activities and programmes. Alison, my colleague, is the person who leads on this. And um, although I was asked to speak, I actually really like people that are doing the work, doing the do, to actually have the platform. So um, Alison's going to talk you through our current work with NHS uh, Warsaw around um, supporting and securing employment for those furthest away from employment at the moment. Thank you, Connie, and um, good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to just take a couple of minutes of everybody's time, really, just to bring to life some real examples of some of the work that we've been doing in Warsaw. So over the last 10 months, we've been leading on a Warsaw borough-wide work for health programme, which was about maximising um, those key worker job opportunities within Warsaw NHS going to our unemployed customers. So to make that happen, we work collaboratively with a number of key stakeholders, such as our local college, such as our local job centres. Um, and we've worked with them collaboratively to scope and tailor a bespoke programme that not only upskills our local job seekers, but connects them to the jobs at the end of it. What we don't want to do is just upskill them and then throw them at the NHS normal recruitment channel. So we've been able to work really closely um, with um, our Warsaw NHS Trust to develop a programme um, to maximise on those outcomes. So how have we done that? So we do use existing adult skills funding um, and this is where our relationship with um, Warsaw College um, comes in because through their funding that they pull down from government we have asked them to develop a two-week um, sector specific um, work academy program um, which is designed to upskill our customers um, on working in the NHS. It's there to um, deliver employability support, to lift their confidence um, in readiness for presenting them um, at a guaranteed interview with the local NHS trust. We then target the re recruitment opportunities at our customers. So we run a very targeted campaign um, and we don't just do that over a website or by just posting on social media. We put a lot of resources into bringing those roles to life. Um, I know that Stephanie said just a short while ago, you know, we often feel that we do have to translate those job descriptions. Um, so the opportunity of running some real sessions virtually um, in the current climate, although we are excited to be going back to delivering those sessions um, on a face-to-face -face basis. But what we want to get over in those sessions is with the right support, we're here to support you to take up those opportunities and, um, you know, get over what a fantastic opportunity that, um, you know, that they are. Um, we've also negotiated with Warsaw NHS Trust to relax and lower the required functional skills level. So to give you an example there, um, a clinical support worker currently in Warsaw, you need to um, be um, achieved a, a level two um, functional skills or a GCSE um, level um, four. Um, we know that's a barrier for some of our customers. Um, so through our work with the, the um, local NHS trust, we've been able to negotiate that they actually relax and lower that um, functional skill level to remove that barrier because there are lots of customers, our customers that are out there who have got the right values, have got the right behaviours, but just need that opportunity to prove themselves. And what the NHS in Warsaw have done is made a commitment to support them when they're successful in getting the job. Um, so they're actually doing their functional skills, upskilling as part of a, a package of in-work support for them. 
Where we've also had some success is um, we know that lots of our customers are new to care, might not necessarily have lots of care experience, but have lots of transferable skills, have the right behaviours, have the right values. So we were able to introduce and influence the, um, the introduction of a values based application form to break down those barriers, to get over, to bring to life how they can um, demonstrate those values and behaviours that the NHS um, are looking for and I'm pleased to report we've been working on it for 10 months but to date we've had 31 local um, job seekers um, secure employment um, through this collaborative model 77% um, of which were previously unemployed for six months um, or more um, but behind every one of those 31 customers is some amazing transformational um, successes and the feedback that we've had um, has been you know really um, successful um, on there um, as well. Obviously, what that job does for the NHS, it gives them a local person that's got a commitment locally to remain in that job. But equally, it improves their health and well-being because get, getting the job is the best um, approach to improving somebody's health. So it's a it's a win-win, really. Yeah. Okay. Connie, Alison, thank you so much. And, and I think, you know, actually make drawing that clear golden thread between kind of the health inequalities that people experience in, in our communities and the access to work and that actually by working with you as housing associations you can work more creatively with the NHS you can do things that perhaps the NHS haven't done before um, and you have that insight about the people who live in your homes who live in your local communities that you can bring to the table so thank you both so very, so much for that if you've got any questions for Connie or Alison then please put them into the Q&A we can hear from one other person and I'm going to invite Ifor to turn his uh, camera on Exactly. <laughs> so trying to get my camera uh, it doesn't seem to be launching can you hear me i can we can hear you Ifa. so so maybe we'll we'll, we'll we'll take your contribution by sound for the time being so just Sorry about that for <laughs> is the uh, Ifa jones he's the head of partnerships at pioneer group and like Walsh, like WHG, Pioneer Group are a, a very place-based landlord. They're, they're, small, they're, they're a much smaller landlord and they work predominantly in Castle Vale in Birmingham. But what's important about the work that they've been doing, they're also part of the Birmingham Anchor, Birmingham Anchor Network, which does include the NHS and the local authority and the universities. It also includes another housing association, Bourneville Village Trust. And they've been doing some really brilliant and pioneering work uh, around uh, kind of engaging with the NHS and supporting people into NHS jobs. So over to you, Ifa. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry that you can't see me and I put on a shirt especially uh, for this uh, uh, event. So as you, uh, as you said, I'm the head of partnerships at the Pioneer Group. We're neighbours actually to Walsall Housing Group. Um, we are a very small independent housing association and rooted in the regeneration of Castle Vale in the late 90s, early noughties and the successor body to the to the to the trust that delivered that regeneration as part of the original regeneration program there was always an emphasis on social and economic delivery holistic delivery as part of the regeneration and that's continued with uh, the pioneer group uh, to date hence some of our uh, work that i'm going to uh, describe we're now active in a broader geography than just castle vale working in some parts of North East Birmingham, including, well, East Birmingham and North Birmingham, although our heartland still is in uh, Castle Vale. We've got a subsidiary charity, Compass Support, and they, for the last uh, 10 years, have been delivering, delivering employment programs alongside uh, wellbeing programs. Uh, but we've now taken that to the next level. Um, four years ago, we delivered Youth Promise Plus, leading a community consortium of small charities uh, for Youth Promise Plus, uh, and we delivered collectively uh, a thousand NEETs into EATSDOM, into employment and uh, education and training. Uh, and we built from that and, and kept those relationships with the third sector in East Birmingham uh, going through Compass. Um, uh, and that's been really uh, helpful. So I was asked as part, and I'll say a little bit about the Anchor Network in a second, but I was asked to develop an employment pilot uh, in response to the COVID pandemic. 
on behalf of the Anchor Network to test out uh, some potential methodologies of how a small community anchor could work to bridge, uh, if you like, the gap between residents and, and employers, particularly uh, the NHS, uh, who are a member of the, um, the UHT is a member of the uh, Anchor Network. In broad terms, we delivered fewer outcomes in Walsall Housing Group, but we did deliver in a five month period, 24 uh, employment outcomes. Critically, we've developed a really sound relationship with the University Hospital Trust, which we're building on now, as well as a, what we've called our inclusive uh, em employment pathway. Uh, and, and we're developing that at the moment. So just to say a little bit about the Anchor Network. So that was established to support the seven members uh, of the of the network, uh, uh, basically bring them together to realise benefits uh, for the Birmingham economy, for the individual organisations and collectively. We've got combined budgets of five billion. Our part of that is very small uh, and a workforce of uh, 50,000 uh, across these uh, institutions. So we are collectively a major economic agents uh, and the idea is by collaborating in procurement, employment and the management of our land and assets, we can play a powerful role in shaping the city economy uh, around it, you know, notions of inclusive growth, etc. So we've got two housing associations in there, as you mentioned, Bournemouth Village Trust and ourselves, the University Hospital Trust, the City Council, two of our universities and the Police and Crime Commissioner. Uh, so... In terms of the pilot, uh, so over six months, five, six months, we established a working methodology, uh, which we call Place to Work, and a strand of that, which we call Hospitality for Health, which was our relationship with the University Hospital Trust, which was our primary uh, uh, employer uh, relationship during the pilot. So we um, specifically on the relationship with the UHT, We've got 15 residents onto their 12 week employability course. And as an outcome of that, about half of them uh, into employment with, uh, with uh, UHT. Um, so uh, what we've done now, following the completion of that pilot, we were successful in getting some two pots of external funding and now have got the capacity to deliver a place to work and hope for uh, hospitality for health for another two years. So that's through HS2 funding and Barrow Cadbury. Um, and that has enabled us to put in place a small team and to really begin to develop uh, in a little bit more depth our, our inclusive pathways methodology, build on those relationships over a longer period of time, five to six months uh, through the, a mainstream approach only will take you so far. And we're now in the middle of mobilizing that. But on top of uh, that, we've really um, pushed our relationships with other anchor organizations in East Birmingham. So we've got about seven charities, uh, some of them housing, coming together to work as a consortium, as we did in, in the uh, earlier program I mentioned, uh, YPP. So we're hoping to drive it across an even wider geography uh, but if we don't do that we'll at least be delivering it to 50,000 residents in in uh, northeast uh, Birmingham. So the other thing that we're doing right now is working with UHT to promote their offer over the summer through a range of community events all uh, COVID friendly hopefully the weather will hold out so we can be outdoors as much as possible. So we really want to uh, um, prioritize our relationship with them in the first stage of the program uh, and to get a conveyor belt going between ourselves uh, and them and our other partners. So uh, our aim collectively in East Birmingham is to put forward a shared prosperity bid next year. Unfortunately, we weren't successful with the Community Renewal Fund bid, but we think that we will be able to make a really strong case uh, next year for that. So uh, the current priority for us is filling some hospital porter positions in Heartland Hospital. 
which is right in the middle of our geography. Uh, and we're really pushing the boat out uh, uh, on, on, on those. Uh, and they're ideal, really, for people who have lost their jobs, um, who will have transferable skills, whether that's from hospitality uh, or elsewhere. Um, so in terms of lessons, um, I think collaborative working with community anchor organisations that are embedded in communities can take you much further than working with just working with the DWP, the local authority and the large employability primes. Obviously those are really key, but we can really add value. Shaping what we've called an inclusive employment pathway really can also, uh, I think, drive forward that added value. Um, the bottom up approach uh, is critical. Uh, I think collectively you can develop better timelines on employment campaigns uh, and working out um, uh, the, the, the training um, timeframes, uh, the logistics of where jobs are located and, and, and so on. And then finally, I think building on uh, what some of the others have said, we have to understand that some of the clients that we're working with, whether they're long term or unemployed, or those who've just lost their jobs are particularly vulnerable and you need to provide a whole range of support, holistic support from advice to well-being, to, to enable them to be successful moving forward. And I think that needs also to carry on beyond just so you get them in a course, you get them in a job, that mentoring support could from the anchor organisations could carry on after that. We know that some of our clients have dropped out uh, because of hidden vulnerabilities and some of those are quite sensitive so understanding that I think is key and then I think it's been touched on earlier the whole bureaucratic process of applying uh, to institutions uh, can be off-putting uh, and a focus uh, a focus on transferable skills and attitude not just uh, uh, competencies can be useful and looking at the language and the bureaucracy of the application process uh, and streaming streamlining that would, is key and we're going to be exploring that in our relationship in the next two years and that is it great lovely Ifa. thank you so much can i just quickly invite everyone to turn their cameras on and i still sadly we're not going to get to see Ifa. Um, we've only got five minutes left for this webinar and there's lots of questions there lots of things about how can i get in contact with local housing associations um, I can, I'm, I'm just sharing my uh, email address, so please contact Hacked, contact me, I can link you up with people at the local level who are doing really great work. Uh, one of the really interesting uh, questions that came through was from Ian Jordan, um, and uh, Peter, I'm going to ask you to address this, because um, you've been really involved for a long time in the whole kind of development and growth of the IPS, individual placement and support. Yeah, so, What's on that question? so just for a bit of context, I sit on the National Expert Forum for IPS, Individual Placement Support Services. And I think, Ian, you make a really good point about how we need to, one, I think, expand the principles of IPS across to other employment services. And that's particularly, I think, in terms of employ and support, rather than always training and training and training. And I think we've got some good examples in the housing association sector of how we can do that. But I also think it's really important that we have a much more networked approach between IPS, between the employment advisors in IAT, and the, um, some of the housing association employment support services. And I very much agree with you that we need to sort of get, get these services facing each other and perhaps a little less facing towards Job Centre Plus and more facing towards a more psychologically informed network of service options at a local level that looks at the whole person. And I think one of the real powers behind some of the housing association work is that they can help with some of the practical barriers and confidence barriers and emotional barriers. And I think and more, that more networked approach would be really good. Excellent, thank you, Peter. And we get funny to see Eiffel, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely shirt. Um, <laughs> So, uh, Connie, there was a question there for WHG about uh, what uh, some of the lessons you've learned from your work and could be transferred to other sectors. What are your thoughts on that? And quite, quite quickly, we're running out of time of today's seminar. Sorry. <laughs> um, strategically, I'd say you've got to invest time in building the relationships and selling your, selling your product, setting your stall out. 
Um, operationally, what do you think, Alison? I mean, for me, resourcing is key. I mean, we started this through quite a pilot approach and um, obviously kept the numbers quite small before we started scaling it up. And in scaling it up, obviously, um, one of the, the implications there was how resource um, intensive um, that model is. Um, but you get what you put in um, at the end, really. So I would say certainly resources. I mean, it was something that we took back to the NHS and as a solution um, locally, they've seconded a resource assistant to me to work on this programme, um, which we're really thrilled about so I've got that resource um it's seconded to me to work on this program until March next year and we're already looking um you know at our work beyond beyond that but they've made a fantastic commitment to develop um their program excellent thank you so we're not going to have a chance to take any more questions I'm afraid um we've, we're about to run out of time there are lots of things in the in the questions about how can I find out about all the really inspiring stuff that you're doing I for that you're doing at WHG and at Agenda how can I get connected so what we will do from here is that we will pub we will uh, uh, release the, the video so, uh, so you can share it with others we're going to um make sure that you you've got you see access to the blog we'll, we'll, we're happy to be that conduit that collects some of this information and puts you into contact with people as i said i put my email address into the chat so please do drop me a line we can connect you and we can take some of this work forward can i just say thank you very much to everybody uh who's joined us today can i thank you particularly all of the panelists and the speakers thank you for joining us and sharing sharing with us your really really inspiring work that you're doing in your local communities and with the nhs can i thank uh, William and his team again at the at the Health Anchor Learning Network for, for, for doing this with us. Um, and just to say again, uh, this is the first of a series. In in September or October, we're going to be doing one looking at what can what, what can the NHS learn from housing around social value. We're going to be looking at the issues of community development, and we're also going to be looking at the issues of economic development mm -hmm. as well. Three areas that housing associations have got tons of experience and doing a huge amount of work across the country uh, in, in those areas and those those questions that we are looking at in the NHS. Thank you for your time today. I do hope that you enjoy the rest of your Friday. You have a good weekend and you enjoy some of the sunshine before it starts raining. Thanks very much, everybody.